Not long ago, we um, highlighted a word um, that maybe you don't use very often. Um, uh, we used, we talked about the word propitiation, I know, once before. And I wanted to do that one more time tonight, uh, talk about a word that we probably mostly only use in settings like this or in Bible classes or sermons or, or, or at church. Um, and But it's a great word and it's one that, that is, uh, is really beautiful in the way that it describes who we are and what we are as Christians. Now the word tonight is consecrated. And the word means sanctify, and that's another one that you might put in that same category, but uh, it, it means separate or set apart. Uh, it's a person or thing, to, to set apart a person or thing from all common purposes, all common uses uh, for some special, uh, usually religious, uh, spiritual use. Um, and it, it holds with it this idea that everything used uh, or offered or consecrated to God has historically, uh, by God's demand, been set apart or separated from all earthly uses. So in the Old Testament, you had people, objects, and even even time, you know, days or certain Certain times were set apart for use in worship. Um, <clears throat> you have a lot of examples of that kind of stuff happening. The Old Testament law, the old law was very physical in nature. There were a lot of emblems. There were a lot of uh, physical things like feasts and physical sacrifices. And uh, we have a lot of great teachers here who, who do a great job of, of highlighting those kinds of things and, and the way that things were done under that law. But, but now, all Christians and its people themselves, instead of all these different objects or time or, or different things, people are to be consecrated or sanctified so that our service or our worship will be pleasing to God. And that's a really neat concept when you think about what God how God looks at us, He looks at us as pure and clean, as pure and clean as any object that He had consecrated or sanctified for use in, in the temple worship or uh, in, in other um, feasts that He prescribed. On a side note, <clears throat> in Hosea 9, um, the idea of sanctification or consecration um, was used, but it was used in a different way. He said that the Israelites at that time had consecrated themselves to the thing of shame. Uh, so it is even possible to consecrate or to set something apart for an evil use or a, a wrong use, which certainly was done and, ha and is done uh, even still. So today we're charged to be living sacrifices. Um, we're supposed to make our lives that living sacrifice for Him as we've been set free from sin. Romans 12, 1 and 2, 1 and 2 present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service. Uh, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed uh, by the renewal, renewal of your mind. So we are, again, now the object. Our hearts are what God consecrates, what He sets apart for His special use and for acceptable worship in His sight. Um, one of the ways that we receive that special uh, sanctification is from the Word of God when Jesus was praying for His disciples in, in John chapter 17. <clears throat> he said, Sanctify them in the truth. Your Word is truth. Um, and, and so he, he talked about sanctifying or consecrating his people, his ministers, um, from regular earthly purposes to become his special servants uh, to do his, 
His will. Albert Barnes wrote that when Jesus prayed here that God would sanctify them, he probably included both of these ideas that they might be made personally more holy and might be truly set apart toward God as servants. So it's a beautiful thought that God would look at us as pure. And it's not because we are pure, it's not because we are clean and free of any guilt. We're only free from the guilt of sins because of the sacrifice of Jesus who, who was that sacrifice once that purifies and cleanses us. Then in a practical sense, um, as far as sanctification goes, certainly we would want to be in our lives regularly set apart. We wouldn't want to um, taint these vessels, our, our bodies, our, our spirits, our, our hearts, by using what is supposed to be set apart for spiritual things for worldly, sinful things. Um, one example I, I looked at today was in the book of James chapter 3 when he's talking about the tongue, how that no one's able to tame the tongue. It's a, it's a restless evil full of de deadly poison. And then he says this, With it we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing my brother, my brothers, these things ought not to be so. And so you see the idea here of how we're to be set apart. Our, our bodies are not to be used for sinful and um, spiritual purposes. Now, God understands that we, that we make mistakes. And it's only, again, because of the purification that happens through the blood of Christ that we, though we do stumble in sin at times, we can be made clean um, and, and pure in His sight. So my challenge for you tonight would just be uh, to ask yourself, have you fully consecrated yourself to the purposes that God has, has set forth for you? Um, or, or are you still using yourself interchangeably in in, in the sinful, worldly uh, things that maybe before uh, we might have been involved in before we gave ourselves to Christ, you know, we used to live in those things and now we, we are not to live in them any longer. Maybe you're still living in some of those, some of those past habits and, and you just need to rethink who you are and, and again consecrate yourself for Christ. And if you need to do that, tonight would be a great night, uh, an opportunity for you to, to make that change. Maybe you're not a Christian. Maybe you have not yet allowed Christ to take your soul from outside of His body and, and place you inside, uh, inside His body or the church. And, and we would be happy to talk to you about that or help you in any way. If you need baptism for the remission of sins, we would help you, love to help you with that. Or if you just want uh, to study more and to learn more about what God wants for you, uh, there are so many of us here who would, who would love to help you with that. But now be a good time. If you have any of these needs, come as we stand and sing together.
join with Bill in welcoming, uh, especially our visitors here tonight. We're glad that you're here. We just uh, have a few announcements we'll, we'll go over quickly, and then we'll be going to our classes here in a few moments. Um, as far as our care lines go, uh, many of you know that uh, our brother Doyle still uh, is now under hospice care. Uh, he is in wonderful spirits and, and uh, just very upbeat and encouraged. Uh, he is he's at peace and, and is uh, we're praying for his comfort and, and for Wanda as well during this this time and his struggle. And we want to pray that things go well with him. A um, couple other updates. Nancy Williams um, has been struggling for some time, of course, and, and she's been having some reactions to medications and is, is in a lot of pain. So I want to pray for her and also for Joy Brooks, who has begun her second round of chemotherapy today. Um, she'll do this for 12 weeks, and uh, so we want to pray that that goes, goes well. We have several others, and we're going to pray for all those here in a few moments. Um, tonight, in our for our Bible classes, Nick Weymouth will be teaching the auditorium class tonight, and the ladies' class uh, will be taught by Dania Petrozella in the library. And so, hope that you can find a good class where you fit in and and uh, find something that will encourage and strengthen you. Our graduation celebration for our Eight seniors will be this coming Sunday night after services. And on that note, um, if you would do us the favor of, if you plan to stay, and we hope that you will, plan to stay to help honor these graduates, um, if you wouldn't mind signing up on the, the sign-up sheet on the rail, just put your family name and then how many, you, your family and guests that you're bringing if you are um, bringing any guests as far as being a, a graduate's family, um, that would be great so that we can uh, make sure that we're going to have enough, enough food. Several uh, events going on, um, so please grab um, one of these sheets so that you can know what's happening. The teens and Jeffrey and I are making the wise decision to jump on trampolines all night tomorrow night at airwalk so all teenagers are invited uh, to to do that D the details are here in this sheet also that's all let's have a prayer before we go to class god you're so good to us we thank you every day for your loving kindness and for the gifts of life, of love, of family, of peace in our lives, even though there are storms around us and sometimes amongst us. But, Lord, you, you do bless us in so many wonderful ways, and we want to always be grateful for what you do for us. We pray for your continual grace and forgiveness as we stumble through life at times and make mistakes, but help us, Lord, to to get up, to dust ourselves off, and to make better choices the next time. Uh, and But help us to rest easy in, in the hope that you've given us, knowing that you're with us and that you, that you do forgive, Father, and forgive fully. Father, tonight we're mindful of our loved ones and our, our precious church family who may be sick or hurting, and we pray especially for... Uh, those that we mentioned tonight and those who are on our care lines. <clears throat> we pray that you would be with our brother Doyle, Doyle Still and ask you for the blessings that only you know how to give, uh, the peace that, that you can bless them with. We, we pray for Doyle and for Wanda and uh, we ask your blessings upon their family. Father, we pray for Nancy Williams and we pray that she'll get some relief. Um, in her situation. We pray for good results from treatments for our sister Joy Brooks, and we ask that you'll be with her during her continuing treatment. We thank you, Father, for your being with Mary Mason Pope, and ask you to continue to bless her. We thank you for the help that she has received, and we ask that uh, you would be with her as she goes forward, 
and just give her a, a long, happy, healthy life. Father, we ask you to be with our brother Jim Banks. Uh, we ask for uh, your care in Charlene Thomas's situation and her, her life, her family. We pray for our sister Felicia Arnold uh, as she looks at surgery in, in the future. We pray for McKinley Livingston. Uh, we ask you to be with Justin Searcy, uh, with Patrick Nichols, William Varner Jr., Sarah Bentley, and Brian Garner. And Father, we ask that you would bless every one of our, uh, our friends and family members who may be struggling with various illnesses. Father, we ask your blessings on this church, and we ask you to be with us, be with each family and each, uh, each child. And ask, we ask you, Father, to just continue to shower your love upon us. Help us to be lights that shine brightly for you. And we ask you to bless us in our classes and, and in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Evening, everyone. How are we? So I'm hearing a lot over here, and that's about it. So, uh, but I know it's Wednesday, so we'll try one more time, and then I will stop heckling you. Afternoon or good evening, everyone. Okay, that's pretty good. All right. I uh, hope everyone is doing well. Uh, I am not Chuck, as you probably have already. Uh, realized, and if uh, not, then two things. One, listen to Daryl more, and two, get some more glasses, because uh, Chuck's a little taller than I am, uh, and uh, his hair is a little bit better managed than mine, uh, but oh well. Uh, I'm glad to be with you uh, to, uh, to fill in, uh, and so we're going to be in First Peter chapter 2 again. I thought what we would do is just sort of pick up from uh, where we left off last time, and uh, and sort of we may get through the rest of chapter 2. We may not. We'll, we'll see. But we get as far as we get, and, and that will be that. So just, I guess, sort of as a, a way of reminder, getting ourselves back into it, um, First Peter was written, of course, by Peter uh, to a group of Christians in very, actually multiple groups of Christians uh, in several different places. We see that right at the beginning, chapter 1, verse 1, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who were elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. So these various regions of the Roman Empire um, where Christians were. And what we noted last time, and we'll, we'll continue this this time as well, Lord willing, um, is this imagery that Peter sets up right at the beginning of the book 
uh, and I would submit uh, shows up time and again uh, throughout the book in various ways. And that's this idea uh, that we as Christians are pilgrims, uh, that we are sojourners, that we are exiles. Uh, different words like that come up uh, in the book, and of course different translations will render a few different Greek words in different ways, and so depending on your translation, you're going to get uh, several of those different words. But this idea, this imagery, um, and you know, we sing songs about it, right? Um, one of the, uh, the songs that, oh, I haven't heard it in a long time, uh, here we are but straying pilgrims here, our path is often in. So some of you know that song. So I promise I'll stop singing because it gets bad if I sing. So, uh, but that song. Um, and so many other songs. That's, I think, probably my favorite uh, of the Pilgrim songs. Uh, but, but that idea, uh, this world is not my home, I'm just a passing through. That, that's the idea. Um, and what we noted last time was that uh, when we're not where we feel at home, um, if we are in a place, talking about physically, um, if we're in a place that is somewhat unfamiliar to us, if we're in a place that is different, that has different customs, that has different values, we can sort of feel disoriented, and that can affect the way that we, well, interact with others, the way that we think through things. Uh, it affects everything. Uh, and, and I asked last time, and I guess I'll sort of ask again, uh, just again as a way of getting back into it. Have you ever been in a place uh, that was culturally very different from what you're used to? And again, as I said last time, I, I've never been out of the country. That hasn't changed in the last few weeks. Uh, but I have been to New York City, which is about as far out of the country as I've ever been. Some of you have been out of the country. Some of you uh, are going to go out of the country. Uh, and some of you, uh, like me, uh, have been limited to the uh, North American continent. Uh, and in my case, just like a few states. Uh, I haven't even made it out really into Texas. Uh, Lord willing, one day, though, because there's a NASA space center out there, so i got to go there one day. But if you've ever been somewhere that is culturally different, uh, maybe you know what that's like. Or even if you've just been to a place that is culturally similar, but it's somewhere you've never been before, and you were looking to find the hotel you were going to stay at, or the house that you were going to go to. So friends of yours maybe moved to a town, you've never been there, and you're going to go. And so, you know, where are we? I don't know where we are. I'm supposed to look for the third shell station and take a left if I've gone to the fifth cell shell station. I've gone too far, and if there's a lake, then I've certainly gone to... Have you ever had people give you directions like that? It's like, what are we... Is this like the 1400s, and we're just learning how to make maps? What's going on here? And so, what do you do when you're like, well, I don't know if I'm there. Let me turn the radio down so I can see better, uh, because there's something about that. That radio makes it to where I can't concentrate, I can't see. So you turn it down. And we do these things when we are disoriented because we're not comfortable. We talk about our comfort zone. Uh, we, we go home and we sit in our favorite chair or our favorite couch or our, our, our favorite bed or our favorite room. And there's something about being in a place where everything makes sense. And as Christians, we're not that. We're not in a place where everything makes sense because we are sojourners. We are pilgrims. Our, our citizenship is not of this earth. This kingdom that Jesus created is not of this earth, Jesus said. If it was... Then when he was being delivered to be crucified, his followers would have uh, fought. Uh, but they didn't because this is not a physical kingdom. And so we live in a world that is not a term we use very often, but I think it's a biblical concept, at least uh, much of it, maybe not all of it. But we live in a fallen world, don't we? Uh, where humans have gone off the rails, where the, the environment itself has been altered because of that sin. Uh, we can think back to the curses that, uh, that God pronounced after uh, Adam and Eve uh, ate of the tree, for example. And so we live in a place that environmentally is not perfect the way that it once was. We live in a society, and again, it doesn't matter where we are, when we are, we're, we live in a society where some values are consistent with the values God would have us to have and some aren't. So we are always living, in a sense, in a foreign land. Uh, and so this, this idea, again, I would submit to you, kind of crops up in the book of 1 Peter. So we looked at the beginning in chapter 2, and we talked about uh, how Peter talks about putting away malice and deceit and hypocrisy and envy and slander. And we, we noted that those kind of emotions uh, sometimes maybe are more prominent when we're not in our comfort zones, when we're not where everything uh, makes sense. We noted in verses 4 and following that we have come to Jesus, uh, who is the, the cornerstone, the stone that was rejected by men, but in the sight of God was chosen, is chosen. 
chosen and precious. And we are living stones being built up as a spiritual house, a, a priesthood uh, that is holy, to offer to, uh, spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God. Um, and we noted in verse 9 and following uh, that we are a chosen race. Uh, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, which on the one hand makes us feel good, on the other hand puts responsibilities on us. So here we are, away from our long home, our eternal home, in this foreign land, and we have responsibilities on top of that. Now, it's not just survive, uh, it is, well, it's what? Notice again verse number 9. We are people of his own possession, that you may, or that we may, proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Uh, that's what we as pilgrims are supposed to be doing. We are supposed to be proclaiming his excellencies, the greatness of who God is. We do that verbally, right? Uh, explicitly. Uh, but we hopefully do that even implicitly, even uh, suggestion-wise, uh, through our behavior, through our actions. Um, that, that we can so hopefully somehow very dimly, very poorly, but reflect the goodness of God in such a way that we proclaim His excellencies uh, even without saying a word, or at least an explicit direct word about God. Verse 10, Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. And so there are blessings uh, that come with this uh, responsibility um, that, uh, that, that we find ourselves in. So this brings us to verse 11, which I believe is about where we were last time. So that's where we'll pick up uh, here in verse 11. So Peter goes on and he says, Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh which wage war against your soul. We're going we're gonna to break a few of those words down. I'm, I like words. Uh, I like the, the funny thing about, about Greek is that, um, and I have to look things up because I have a horrible memory, and you all know that. Um, I make that lame joke about I have a bad memory, I have a short-term memory problem, and also I have a short-term memory problem. It's a horrible joke, but I make it all the time. But I don't have a good memory. I don't know if I've told you this joke before. Stop it. You've told them the joke. But I, when I look it up, when I look up Greek words, which is what I have to do in order to be able to, to figure anything out about it, um, what I love about it is that many Greek words are word pictures. They're, they're visual. Um, and that helps me because I'm kind of a, a visual kind of guy in some ways uh, in terms of thinking, uh, diagrams and charts and things like that. And so here are a couple of the, the words here. I'm going to look at a few of them as we go. So in verse 11, we get these two words. Now, I'm reading out of the English Standard. Again, here's where maybe your translation is going to have some different words um, sort of pulling from the same pool of words, perhaps. Um, the English Standard renders this, again, as sojourners and exiles. Uh, the King James renders this as strangers and pilgrims. And yours may have some combination, either, neither, or both. So what are those words? The first word there... Uh, which, again, the English Standard translates as sojourners. The King James translates as strangers. That word there uh, literally means someone who dwells near or is a, a neighbor. But, of course, the idea is, well, it's just this same idea. We are here, but we're sort of separate. Uh, that we are sort of... The, the word actually is a compound of two words... One, which is a word that basically means beside, and the other word, which is one of the words for house. So what we are is people who have a house beside. House beside what? A house beside the people who live here. You see how that word picture carries the idea of, well, they live here, and they live here, they live here, and I live beside them. Uh, it, it, we are together, we are connected, but there is a separation. There is some difference. And hopefully that's us, right? You think about what, did, what did, would Paul say in 1 Corinthians when he was dealing with some of the issues that were going on there in the church at Corinth. In particular, uh, he was dealing in that particular context we're about to talk about with uh, some of the... Uh, uh, the, 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 the individual who was in a relationship with his father's wife, you remember that? Paul says that even the Gentiles don't do things like this. And, and the unfortunate reality is that you people there at the church at Corinth are bragging about this. And, and that was the context of what he was dealing with. But he makes this point. He says that I wrote to you in a previous letter. We don't have that letter, by the way, of course. But... I wrote to you in a previous letter, he tells them, not to associate with, you know, uh, fornicators or immoral people, idolaters, and so on. Remember this passage? 
And he says, I certainly did not mean those of the world who are idolaters, fornicators, and so on, because then you would need to go out of the world. He says, I was referring to anyone who is a so-called brother, who is a Christian, someone who claims to be a Christian who does these things. And so the, the, the main point there is, again, dealing with this context of Christians uh, who are doing things that they know they ought not do. But buried in there, just sort of as an, as a, a, an assumed premise is, Christians are going to be in the world. So we're in it. And what was the sort of the cliche? We're in the world, but not of the world. But that's a biblical cliche, right? And that word here carries that idea. We're here, and there are connections, but we're a little bit different. It's much like the Israelites that were taken away into Babylonian captivity when the southern kingdom was, was taken away into captivity. And the admonition by the, the legitimate prophets of God was... Yes, this is going to happen, and it's not going to turn around immediately. So you you get families, and you be in these cities, and you pray for the good of the city that you're in. You have houses, you have families, you have farms, you, you, you take up root. Even though you are going to be Israelites, you're going to be different than your Babylonian neighbors, and you're going to have a different set of priorities and values and, and religious uh, you know, demands and, and behaviors. So you're there, you care about them, but you're different. So that's kind of the idea. Uh, the second word uh, is, and the, uh, the King James is rendered, rendered, rendered. Yeah, well, I'm all Southern for a minute there. It's rendered. It's rendered uh, as pilgrims. Uh, the, uh, the King, uh, excuse me, the, um, uh, the English standard renders this as exiles. Um, the, uh, the definition here, one who comes from a foreign country into a city or land to reside there by the side of the natives. Again, it's a very similar word picture. Um, it, it's, uh, it's, again, it's a compound word. One word means beside, just like that first word did. Uh, and the other word is a word uh, that means to be present. So to be present beside. So two words carrying the same idea, uh, that, that we are to be there, but we are to be different. Uh, and so, as Forrest Gump would say, both are happening at the same time. That's kind of the idea. We as humans want to go to extremes, don't we? You know, it, it seems like it, it, it's, it's either all or nothing. Uh, it's like the Billy Joel song, I don't know why I go to extremes. Well, it's a human thing. We as humans do this. Um, and, and here's one of these areas where we have to be careful that we don't go to those extremes, but rather that we maintain balance. Uh, that we don't bury our head in the sand and move away from everything in the world. And I'm just going to be over down here because it's where us Christians are, right? We don't, we don't do that. But on the other hand, we try to keep uh, our identity as, as children of God. Uh, we don't want to go to either extreme. These two words remind us of the detention there uh, and the balance that we're supposed to find. So, beloved, he says, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to do what? To abstain from the passions of the flesh. This word passions is sometimes translated as lusts, right? Um, and what's interesting about the word is that it's a word that's used sometimes in a good context and sometimes in a bad context. I remember when I was a kid growing up, and this is, this is no offense to anyone who ever taught me as a, as a child, as a young person, as a young Christian, but the, the idea of what lust meant was very vaguely defined. Anybody ever, excuse me, anybody ever have a similar experience? That, what does it mean to lust? Uh, typically, it, it meant something of a sexual nature, uh, and it was bad, right? That, that's, for me, that was about, for a while there, that was about as much detail as I got. Um, and uh, you know, maybe that was, that was fine. Maybe I didn't need more detail. But what's interesting about the word is that it's not related just to physical ha ha kinds of desires. I'm sorry, I'm still a child, so I, I, that's how I describe things. So it's not the ha ha desires just those. It does include those, of course, but it's not re solely related to that. Uh, there are words in the New Testament that, that carry a, a particularly sexual connotation. This is not one of them. Um, this is a word that means desire, strong desire. Uh, it's from two words. One word, a lot of Greek words are from two words. Uh, one word, which basically is like a strengthener word. It's, it's like jazzed up. It's like times two. Um, and then the other word is actually the same word that in some contexts is translated as anger. Um, there, there's a couple of different words for anger in the New Testament. One of them is, is the word that sometimes is used to describe God's anger. Uh, it, it is an anger that is a righteous anger. It is a, if you could put it this way, it's a calm anger. It's a reasoned anger. Uh, it's an anger that says, you know, what that what is happening there is wrong, and and to be fair and to be just means to be upset by it. 
There's another word that is never used to describe God, but it is used to describe us, and it is condemned. And that word is thumos. Uh, and that's what this word, lust, or passions, as the English standard renders it, is a combination of. This, this word that means like real strong version of, and this word that means sort of passion. Um, and that's why the English standard renders it as passionate. Um, it, 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 it is. It is this idea of a strong desire. That, that When you think of this word in its anger context, it's sort of like white-hot anger. We, we've experienced that. Have we ever experienced that? Yeah. What What is your berserker button? What is your, oh, no, you just did not button? I don't know what it is for you, but most of us have at least one. Um, I'm sorry, I'm a child of the 80s. Marty McFly's was don't call him chicken. If you call Marty McFly chicken, he's going to get all upset. Um, mine is when people park in a handicapped spot and they're not handicapped. I know it's cliche, but... It, 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 I try to do a better job, and I do a better job than I used to. But it used to just fly all over me. Uh, it's like, you're not handicapped. But what's even worse is when you park in the blue dash zone, which is not actually a spot. It's designed for wheelchair loading and unloading. It's like when you go to the airport. The white zone is for the loading and unloading of vehicles only. Well, the blue dash zone is for the loading and unloading of wheelchairs and people with walkers and such things only. It's not a spot for your car. It's not a spot for your motorcycle. Uh, and so that's one of those things where if I have to, I have to be careful so that the thumos. But what is it? It's that white hot anger. It's that I'm not thinking. It just it happened and whoop, there it is. Right? As opposed to that righteous anger that says, you know, I've thought about this and I'm upset about it. So, so what we are to abstain from is these sort of, I'm not thinking about it, I'm just desiring very strongly, remember the first part of the word, very strongly desiring something that I ought not. That's the other part of the definition, typically, uh, at least when you look in you know, dictionaries and lexicons and, and things along those lines, is it is, um, here's one, desire, craving, longing, desire for what is forbidden. Uh, and so it is this combination of the thing that I ought not desire and the, the intensity of the desire. Now, now, does this relate to this context of being sojourners? Well, we're, we're living in, a, in, a, in a, a society, regardless, again, of where we are, when we are, where there are values and priorities that are not as they ought to be. We feel uncomfortable. We desire things that make us, make us comfortable. And our flesh, and this does specifically mention our uh, fleshly uh, lust or desires, um, and so our bodies crave things. And again, this is, means it's not, it, it does include the sexual, but it's not just the sexual. Our bodies want us to do all sorts of different things. Um, and we have, to, we have to fight against these. We have to abstain from them because they are waging war against our souls. And that's an interesting thing to think about. Um, you know, you, you think, about, think about sickness, you think about disease, and you think about the idea um, of, of our bodies fighting off some kind of attacker and our immune systems, and they are beautiful and they are wonderful. And then you read about um, or maybe experience uh, autoimmune diseases. Uh, which are where your immune system thinks that yourself is the enemy, your own body is the enemy. Um, and, and spiritually, we all have the autoimmune disease known as being in a fleshly body. Our, our bodies want things, and our bodies don't care whether these things are right or wrong, or if they are right in this context but wrong in this other context, or if this is too much or if this is too little. Our bodies just want um, and we have the responsibility to say, hold up now, body. That is not appropriate in this context or in this amount or ever. And so our bodies wage war against us. And so we think about the enemy within. Indeed, we face an enemy uh, within. And so Peter is urging us uh, to abstain not just to, well, yeah, but to abstain. That's a strong word, uh, these things. Verse 12 Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. We, we sort of alluded to this a second ago, uh, talking about the idea of proclaiming God's excellencies, not just by the explicit words that we say, let me talk to you about Jesus, let me talk to you about, about God, but, but how we live our lives. And here Peter says, keep our conduct honorable amongst the Gentiles. The King James says, have your conversation, which 
in the 1600s meant what we mean now by conduct. Um, honest uh, is the word there that was used back then amongst the Gentiles. And that word there, honest uh, or honorable, it's interesting. It, it means something that is good in the sense that it is perceived as good, that it is useful, um, that it is beneficiary. Um, that's sort of as opposed to uh, things that may be intrinsically good, not to get too far into a philosophical logic discussion. But when we think about value, um, there are two types of value that are logically possible. Um, there, is, there is instrumental value and there is intrinsic value. Um, typically the way that I, I sort of uh, try to differentiate them is imagine right now that I've got a bunch of, uh, of metal uh, that I've got right here in the lectern podium thing and I'm going to give everybody one pound of the metal. And you can choose between one pound of aluminum or aluminium for our British friends and one pound of gold. All right, so who wants the aluminium? Yeah, nobody, right? It's like, I go to Walmart and get a bunch of cans and have that. Who wants the gold? Everybody wants the gold, right? Why? Because it's gold. Now, let's, let's change the scenario. Let's say that I've still got a pound of metals, um, but let's say instead of here in the church building, we're in a submarine, and the submarine is slowly sinking to the bottom of the sea, and it is letting on water, and we are in a room, and we are behind a bulkhead, and in order to be able to get out of here, and there's a way to get out, but we've got to get through that bulkhead right there, and it is bolted shut. And so, or maybe we're all in individual ones, and somehow I'm able to magically give you a pound of metal. And again, now it's a pound of gold or a pound of, let's say, stainless steel. And by the way, the gold is in the shape of a brick, but the stainless steel is the shape of various tools, uh, wrenches and the like. So you're in a submarine, it's sinking, you need to be able to get bolts and nuts and things off, and I'm going to either give you a pound of gold or a pound of steel in the shape of various tools that you could use to get out. Which one are you going to choose? We're going to choose, we're going to choose the stainless steel, right? Why? The, the intrinsic value is still the same. It's a pound of gold versus a pound of, in this case, stainless steel. What's the difference? The difference is the instrumental value. The gold does me no good in this slowly sinking submarine, but the tools allow me to get out. And so that's instrumental versus intrinsic value. And what, what Peter is saying here is let, and this distinction is perhaps we shouldn't always press it too hard. Greek, like any language, is flexible and malleable and, and, and you know, you know, you think about words that change meaning over time, and in this context it means this, in this context that, that means something else, just like in English. I love potato chips, I love my wife, I love, you know, uh, Alabama football, and hopefully I love all those in different senses. Well, we can't press this distinction always super, super hard, but that having been said, the word that's chosen is the word that's chosen, and it's a word that means that which is instrumental, that which is useful. So it, it, hopefully, perhaps, maybe it reminds us that our responsibility as sojourners is not just to be good in a moral sense that is you know, sort of intrinsic, but also in ways that, again, people can perceive as useful. You, know, you and your spouse had a disagreement, but apparently you, you talked through it and you, you prayed about it and you, and you continue to view the other as a partner and an ally and a, and a dear loved one as opposed to creeping in adversarial approaches. And that worked for you. Well, where did you get that idea from? Well, I got it from God's Word. You know, you were, I saw you, the boss came in, and the boss dropped the hammer on you, and, and you behaved with grace and with, with charm, and, 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 and yeah, for a while there, things didn't go well for you, but, um, you know, you still seem happy, and, and we're thinking, actually, that that boss might get fired, and someone else might come in, and maybe, how did that happen? That, where did you get that idea? Again, got it from God's Word. You see the idea there? Um, that, that it's, it's, it, it, it's behaviors that are good, morally good, but that also sh that can be seen, even by those in the world around about us. We, we don't do what we do just to please people, but certainly there are, again, in any society, areas where what society thinks of as good and what God thinks of as good are going to overlap. we got to be doing those things so that people can see, well, yeah, I understand that that's good, and I see that you did that. And it's a bridge. It's a bridge to, to values that we may not share. I mean, think about right now all of the values that our society has that are at odds with the values that God has. And think about all the ones that, that, that are shared. Those are our bridges. 
Those are our way to get our neighbors, those whom we are living beside, uh, to, to see and maybe be willing to explore other ideas that they had not considered. Um, so that's that. Uh, let's keep on going. We'll finish this, um, this sentence. Keep your conduct honorable amongst the Gentiles so that when they speak against you as evildoers, notice not if, but when. When they speak of you as evildoers. Again, because of the disconnect, the dissonance between God's values and society's values, if we are doing as we ought to, we will be spoken of as evildoers. Not evildoers, evildoers. What did Jesus say about the world and him and his followers and hatred? What did he say? Don't be amazed when they hate you. Why? Because they hated Jesus first. We shouldn't be surprised about that. We shouldn't necessarily be like, I'm going to go out today and make the world hate me. Now make me feel better. You hate me? That's because you're palm scum and I love the Lord and you don't. That's not our goal. We're not trying to make people upset, uh, but it is a natural consequence. What did Jesus talk about? He said, I didn't come to bring peace, but a long, sharp thing, a sword, right? Not the idea that Jesus was necessarily like, my goal is to upset people. But by preaching the truth, but by being the truth, uh, the way and the life as Jesus was, is, and always will be, the reality is that there was going to be conflict. Uh, so you don't seek conflict for its own sake, but it is an unavoidable byproduct of living as one all in a world that isn't. And so they will speak against us as evil evildoers. And so when they do that, they may see your good deeds, again, the deeds that they can perceive as good, and glorify God on the day of visitation. So that's two verses, and we've got ten minutes left, and I've been burr, 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 the whole time. Questions, comments, observations, disagreements. Actually, I, I stopped at the bus for a second. Now's your chance to, you know, get off the bus or to argue with the bus driver. No. Okay, then, here we go. We're going to keep get back on the road now, uh, and we'll get into verse number 13. So, here we are as pilgrims, as sojourners, and we find ourselves in this foreign land that we have come to dwell in and to be concerned about and to strive to uh, set an example for, and this land is run by rulers. <laughs> Not the things that are made of wood and that we used to measure things. Sorry, I'm a child, so I thought the land ruled by rulers. And Anyway, but there are leaders. There are always going to be leaders. And what are our responsibilities in relation to those leaders, into those rules and regulations and systems of, of, uh, of, of order uh, and, and even coercion, uh, to, be, to be frank about it? What are we supposed to do? Verse 13, but... There's no but there. Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. We are to be subject. Literally, this word means order yourself underneath. And so we see how that is the idea of being a subject uh, and subjecting oneself. There is an authority structure, and we are to order ourselves under that structure. Now, of course, as a, a, a member of the class of people known as United States citizens, being subject to this structure still means that we get to do things like vote, right? Uh, back in November when we went and voted, if we went and voted, we were not putting ourselves above the structure. We were being under the structure, but the structure by its very nature says... I want your opinion. Please go vote. Uh, and so we can vote. We can run for office. Now, can a Christian run for office and be a leader and yet be under the authority? Of course. Of course that's possible. Uh, now, if we lived in a country where people weren't allowed from amongst the people to be chosen to be rulers, well, that would be a different story. So I guess it's a good thing that we live uh, in this country. Not everything about it is perfect, and there are advantages and disadvantages to being a Christian in the United States of America, no doubt about it. But one of those advantages uh, is that, as we have this responsibility, regardless of where we are, uh, to be subject to uh, the human institutions uh, that, uh, that we find ourselves. The King James rendered that as ordinance, every human ordinance. Literally, that word carries the idea of the act of founding or establishing or building or creating, um, and, and, and then it came to sort of have this political or, or governmental uh, kind of connotation. Uh, and so 
any of these institutions, whether it be the emperor uh, as supreme or to governors, lower level leaders. But notice, notice this last part of verse 14. As, uh, or to governors as sent by him to do what? You know, sometimes people will, will, will try to invoke God um, or, or, you know, whether God the Father or God the Son um, in order to, um, you know, argue for a particular a governmental um, setup, you know. Uh, and if you ever, if you're on social media these days, sometimes people do that. Well, you know, Jesus would, here's what Jesus would say about this particular political issue that we're dealing with today. Um, and people do that. And, and interestingly enough, you'll have people on both sides. You know, Jesus would be opposed to this. No, Jesus would be in favor of this. Uh, and, and, there, and, and I'm not, I'm not putting it this way. I know I'm kind of using a certain tone that, that sort of just, but the, the inquiry is a very valuable one, is it not? What, what kinds of laws would God have us to have? What kinds of government institutions would God have us to have? The Old Testament, the, the Israelite nation, was a fusion of the secular and the spiritual, wasn't it? But what did we say earlier about the kingdom? What did Jesus say about the kingdom? It's not of this earth. The spiritual kingdom is separate. But certainly God has some ideas about what kinds of institutions uh, he would prefer for us to have. Now, some would argue the New Testament is replete with, with ideas here. Some would argue that it isn't. It's a fascinating discussion. But here we do get a little bit of something that can kind of give us some kind of a road map. What is it? That, that Peter, at least, is assuming here governments are going to be doing. And notice that Paul uses very similar language uh, in uh, Romans, for example, um, in, in this same kind of discussion. What does he say? Um, or two governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. It seems to be, if we can come up with it, maybe I've missed something, but, but here seems to be, and again in Romans, seems to be about as close as we get to some sort of explicit statement of what governments ought to be doing. Punishing evildoers and praising those who do right. Now, of course, the weeds that you get into is, well, what's meant by evildoers? And to what extent uh, should evildoers be punished? Um, and, and you think about, well, what about someone that chooses to, to never worship you know, God? Sunday comes and goes, and they don't worship. Is that doing wrong? Well, I think many Christians would argue that if God expects us to do this and we don't do it, uh, then it would be. And some would argue that perhaps it's, it's not a category of evil, but let's assume that it is. Should governments make people go to church, as it were? I don't know that we would, would argue that they should. Again, that seems to be more of a fusion of church and state. So certainly there's still some wiggle room. This doesn't solve the question, but at least gives us some kind of an idea. What is it the governments are, be, are doing? Well, Peter seems to be thinking that they're going to be punishing evildoers. Word there for punishment, normal word for punishment. A revenging, a vengeance, a punishment. And again, we think about what, Pete, what Paul says. Don't take vengeance on your own. Leave it to God, he says. And then Paul starts talking about governments. The avenging for wrong that is done is not left to the individual Christian to do, but to the governments, to those institutions that exist. So punishing those who do evil, the evildoers. Uh, and, and indeed, it's, it's, a, it's a compound word from two words. Uh, and one of them is a word that means of a bad nature. Um, not as it ought to be, of a mode of thinking or feeling of acting that is base or wrong or wicked. Uh, the third definition, troublesome, injurious, pernicious, destructive, and baneful. So some might think that the idea here is perhaps evildoers in the active sense, those who are actively causing harm and evil to others. Um, that's, that's maybe a possibility, but again, I don't know that we can be dogmatic about limiting the definition to the scope uh, of that. But, but that's at least a possibility. Um, and so we are to keep ourselves in submission to these governments that hopefully will be engaged in punishing evildoers and praising those uh, who, who do well. And certainly don't we need both? You, people respond differently. People are motivated by different things. You ever, you ever heard of the five love languages? I forgot who wrote this book, but it's relatively uh, well known. The five love languages. And one, some people's love language is gift giving. Uh, some people's love language is you know, physical contact. Uh, one love language is words of affirmation. Uh, and that means, that means praise. 
not necessarily not the idea of buttering up or insincere praise, but of of being told you did a good job. That was a good job. Uh, and governments, it seems apparently, are to be engaged in something along those lines, holding up as virtuous as worth emulating behavior that is indeed virtuous and worth emulating. Uh, and so that is, that is what we're supposed to do. Notice verse 15, For this is the will of God, that by doing good you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Again, we, we think about words like ignorant as an insult, but it simply means those who don't have knowledge. Uh, there are a lot of things I'm ignorant about, uh, and, and that's, that's okay, but when we look at God's Word, when we're looking at the most important things in life, we don't want anybody to be ignorant, but there are those who are ignorant. And so the idea is that those who are ignorant, who speak about things about which they know nothing, who have opinions about things that aren't informed opinions when it comes to spiritual and ethical matters, the idea is that we, by doing what we ought to be doing, can put to silence these people uh, who are behaving foolishly. We are to live as people who are free, not using our freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. We are to honor everyone. We are to love the brotherhood. We are to fear God, and we are to honor the emperor, and that is where we will stop. So thank you so much for your attention this evening, and as always, you're chuckling at my humor, and hopefully, or my attempts at humor. Hopefully something was said tonight that was useful. Have a good rest of the week.